Welcome back everybody, this is King Kong 9200 and today we're going to be delving into our two favorite kaiju characters, King Kong and Godzilla. Ever since I was a kid, which was like two weeks ago, I'd always thought about how King Kong and Godzilla felt. And no, not their skin, but how they felt emotionally. As actual sentient beings with minds and feelings. I'm sure we've all thought about this, but once you really do think about their feelings, like heck, even placing yourselves into their shoes, you start to realize that these two monstrous beings are quite tragic. Now the thing with giant monsters is that they obviously can't show their emotions that well. Like seriously, imagine Gigan or Mothra sad. Whether it's due to technical limitations like Sumation, or monsters having quite odd physiology not meant for showing human-like characteristics and expressions overall, this could very well quite hinder the emotional attachment the audiences have to the kaiju characters. So why are audiences so attached to other monsters, but mostly King Kong and Godzilla? One could simply say the latter two are both main characters, and with more movies you get more attached to the characters, but I think it goes far deeper than that. I think that since both creatures are quite tragic in their own ways, audiences are able to sympathize and even root for the main monster, even when that monster is in the wrong. Looking at you, GMK Godzilla, punishing everybody and killing the guardian monsters. So we are going to go in depth with each character and truly analyze just how tragic each character is. Without further ado, let's begin. Let's start with the monster who birthed an entire genre and the former character of this video, the eighth wonder of the world himself, King Kong. Everybody knows how the story of King Kong goes. A group of people go to an island, girl is sacrificed to a giant ape, people bring the ape down and take him to New York and he's tragically shot down by biplanes. Now of course, when you hear that summary, it's just quite sad, but let's take it a step further and actually analyze King Kong as a character. The 1933 incarnation of King Kong, while a bit goofy at times, comes from a tragic past. He's the last of his kind, he's had no other surviving members of his species for years on years, and we see that once King Kong takes Anne, he's struck with a sudden urge to protect her. He cares about her, he makes an emotional connection to Anne that he hasn't felt for years, decades. Other than Kong's species, all the island has are dinosaurs and creatures who kill. Danger is in every corner. And so, King Kong lived in isolation for most of his life. He's fighting the worst kinds of creatures just to stay alive. In comes Anne. Now this particular Anne is always horrified by Kong. She yells every single time she's in his hand. Like, it becomes obnoxious pretty early on. All Kong wants to do, and does, is protect her. He goes through many dangerous scenarios, out of his way to protect her. And what does he get in return? A person who constantly fears him right up to his death. After going to great lengths to protect Anne from people who he thinks are trying to harm her, Kong gets attacked by both natives and the crew, eventually getting hit with gas bombs. So in addition to truly having nobody in his life ever since losing all members of his species, his family, he gets taken away from the only home he has ever known, brought to a new world in which literally everybody fears him, and he's shot to his death on top of the one place he thought he was safe. It's pretty sad. That's just the tragedy of King Kong. Now most films that stick with the classic story tend to stray close to this theme, but they're each so different in their own way. But the first King Kong that we all know and love has one of the saddest lives in nearly all of cinema. 21 years later in 1954 comes another giant monster, inspired by the very first one and absolutely just revolutionized the genre. The monster in question is none other than Godzilla. As many will know, due to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II, Godzilla stood as a metaphor for the dangers of nuclear weaponry. Godzilla was first a prehistoric reptile. Once an American hydrogen bomb was detonated at Bikini Atoll, Godzilla becomes heavily mutated. He develops these scales reminiscent of keloid scars, his back plates grow, but most importantly, Godzilla himself grows to 50 meters in height. With King Kong being the last of his kind, Godzilla is easily the first of his. Not only did the H-bomb destroy Godzilla's home, but as Dr. Yamane proposes in the film, it killed his entire family while severely burning and mutating Godzilla himself. So this Godzilla is living in constant pain, whether it's physical pain due to his mutations or emotional pain from the loss of his entire family and kind in a blink of an eye. Godzilla is always in pain. And we truly get to see Godzilla express this eternal anger. Maybe not surface level due to the technical limitations of Suitmation, but we can tell by what he does physically that he is angry. 
He completely destroys Tokyo. He takes countless lives, no matter if they're innocent or not. This is just pure anger, and behind a lot of anger is sadness. At the intro, I said Godzilla punishes innocent humans. While this is wrong, of course, that doesn't mean this isn't justified. It completely is. Godzilla's entire kind was innocent as well. For all we know, they could have been a peaceful species. But when certain humans go about starting conflict with nature, it backfires on them. Maybe not the ones who called the shots and detonated the H-bomb. Godzilla doesn't care. He would have punished everybody who got in his way. He wants to punish all of humanity for making him the first of his kind. And at the same time, the last. And while this power is dangerous, it's still justified. Yet at the end of the day, he's killed by Daisuke Serizawa. Even Serizawa knew humanity would exploit his weapon for unforeseen evils, resulting in him cutting the rope that would have brought him back from underwater. He detonates the oxygen destroyer to save countless lives and the future generations of Japan, who have already endured so much. In a way, he spared Godzilla of the sadness and pain he constantly lived in. It's really tragic. So we can see that both monsters are very similar. Kong is the last of his kind and Godzilla is the first of his. Both could not be more lonelier. And both also suffered horrible deaths that they did not deserve. But let's take it a step further since we all know the two kaiju eventually meet in the Showa timeline. After Godzilla had died in 1954, it turns out another Godzilla survived the bombs and was mutated similarly to the original Godzilla. This Godzilla had taken shelter on the remote Iwato Island. By the time 1955 Godzilla raids again period, one of the main characters discovers Godzilla locked in battle with Anguirus. The two battle off a cliff and are not seen for a while. It's then discovered by a scientist that Godzilla could be lured away via lights. But this isn't because he's some massive animal who just gets distracted so easily. And I'm looking at you, Godzilla 84. No. The reason is that Godzilla has an instinct to go toward the light because it possibly reminds him of the atomic bomb that created him. The two fight later on in the film with Godzilla killing Anguirus, and after he just calmly walks away. He was spotted weeks later, attacking a fishing boat and walking onto an icy island. When the JSDF spots this, they decide to shoot around the slopes of the island and essentially bury Godzilla in ice. So now, Godzilla is buried in this massive heap of ice, alone. Until seven years later, King Kong is discovered on Faroe Island. Now this King Kong is not the original 1933 King Kong. This is a different one entirely. Instead of being 18 to 25 feet tall, this King Kong is a whopping 143 feet tall. This Kong's origins are actually far more unknown and remain a mystery, but we do know the natives of the island worship Kong and call him the giant demon god. Kong stays behind the wall in the jungles of the island in exchange for not human sacrifices, but massive amounts of ferrolactin juice. Because why not? King Kong's roars are heard through the mountain and all over the island. When the islanders are attacked by Udaku, a massive octopus kaiju, King Kong breaks through the wall to defend the natives. He wins and decides to get drunk off the pharaoh juice, and he ends up passing out. The characters of the film build a raft for Kong and they take him off his island. He wakes up on the raft, tied down, and is furious. Who knows if he came off his island before? Some think he may not even know how to swim, which we all know is not true. Kong has always been a perfectly fine swimmer. Anyways, the greedy characters try to exploit Kong for money, and after a bit of a scrap, they end up shooting the explosives set on the raft. Kong is nowhere to be seen. Just kidding, he rises out of the water perfectly fine and unscathed. Kong roars in fury and makes his way to Japan. Now before we continue with Kong, we should acknowledge that Godzilla's iceberg he's been trapped in has since broke away off the sea and thawing, until a submarine crashed into it and broke Godzilla free. The anger and rage Godzilla now holds is monstrous. He instantly makes his way to a naval base and completely annihilates everybody and everything there. Kong and Godzilla end up meeting and attacking each other. You now Kong throws some boulders, but Godzilla literally has the high ground, so he just fires his atomic breath at Kong, who ends up walking away in confusion of what just happened. Later on during nighttime, Kong runs around Tokyo and ends up attacking a train. But he notices a woman named Fumiko on the train. He takes an interest to her. He grabs her and drops the train, going on a very nice little evening stroll with her screaming frantically in his hand. Yeah, just another Friday. 
Now, even though we don't get a lot of this King Kong's origins, the fact that we don't get glimpses or words of other Kongs being on Faroe Island, as well as how this Kong seems to connect with Fumiko, suggests that this Kong may be the last of his kind. It could be a stretch, sure, but I don't see why King Kong would connect with Fumiko unless he honestly has a connecting with any other being emotionally for god knows how long. Decades, possibly. But there is also the idea that it very well may be instinctive, considering drafts of the sequel film have King Kong care for a baby, like literally, instinctively protecting this kid and following his gut to track him down when the kid gets taken away from him. Alright, too far ahead. Let's back it up for a sec. So now we know Kong has Fumiko climbs up the National Diet Building and just sort of stands there. Uh, the characters fire off this Soma Berry Juice and start singing the song the natives would sing to Kong. And whether Kong was thinking about how much he misses the natives or if he's worried about their safety, it's all up to interpretation. But Kong eventually knocks out completely drunk and lets go of the only being he has connected with emotionally for a very long time. He's then captured yet again. So while Kong was rampaging in Tokyo, Godzilla was just walking around. He ended up getting trapped by the JSDF for a couple seconds before escaping it unfazed. He's later struck by 1 million volts of electricity, causing him to turn around completely and just climb Mount Fuji. And when Kong is captured, he's taken there to fight Godzilla unwillingly. The two scrap and Kong ends up winning the battle, then going home to his island to live in peace. While these interpretations of the characters are not as tragic as their original counterparts, they do share a bit of that tragedy. As we all know, Godzilla is the last and first of his kind who still gets attacked constantly. He also ends up trapped in that iceberg for 7 years, and yet again, he gets attacked. King Kong has a high chance of being the last of his kind, possibly sharing no emotional connection with anything for decades and feared by people who he would protect. He was also taken away from his home, blown up, and exploited to fight Godzilla for money, publicity, and to save lives. Whatever it was, he was against his will most of the film. But things wrap up nicely for this Kong as he still has a happy ending. Godzilla, on the other hand, has a whole other emotional roller coaster he goes on for years. Godzilla is seen as a constant villain throughout the next two films. He wakes up from a supposed coma King Kong may have sent him into, and he attacks Japan yet again, this time the city of Nagoya. Godzilla seems to be unstoppable, you can tell he's just fueled by hatred and sadness. Mothra fights him and fails, but her larvae succeed in webbing him up and sending him off a cliff into the waters below. By Ghidorah the three-headed monster, Godzilla is back. He attacks a cruise ship, so his anger has not faded, and he makes landfall in Japan to fight Rodan on Mount Fuji. King Ghidorah arrives onto Earth and attacks, but Goji and Rodan are too busy scrapping. Mothra's larva tries to get the two to stop fighting and assess the threat, and here's where it gets interesting. We actually see these monsters communicating with each other. We get to literally see, from Godzilla's point of view, why he is eternally angry. Now the dialogue goes as follows. Mothra says, let's stop fighting and unite against King Ghidorah, in which both Rodan and Godzilla respond with them not caring as it's none of their business. Godzilla then goes on to say that he has no reason to help humans. Humans always make trouble. And Rodan agrees. Mothra tells him not to fight anymore, it's no use. Godzilla and Rodan both want an apology. They then proceed to nearly fight again before Mothra snaps them to their senses. So we cut away for a bit. You know, humans running away, Ghidorah taking countless lives, the usual. And uh, Mothra tells the two that Earth doesn't only belong to the humans, it's theirs as well, so they should defend it. It seems like they're almost convinced, but ultimately they're both already too hurt by what humans have done. Mothra goes to fight Ghidorah alone, and the two kaiju end up deciding to fight Ghidorah for Mothra and for the Earth. They succeed in defeating Ghidorah, shameless plug, if you want to see what would happen if they didn't succeed in defeating Ghidorah, check out this video on my channel. And the Earth is saved! <laughs> From then on, Godzilla eases his way into becoming a hero and defender of humans. So the second generation Showa Godzilla, while definitely rooted in sadness similar to the original, ends up becoming a full-fledged hero. The Heisei version is also a second generation Godzilla, seeing as the first 1954 one is canon while everything else after during the Showa timeline is not. So this second Godzilla was originally a Godzillasaurus that was mutated by the radiation of nuclear energy. In Godzilla vs King Ghidorah, aliens basically go into the past and alter the timeline by taking this Godzilla off the island into the Bering Sea, where they thought it would die from injuries it sustained in battle. As it turns out, 
a nuclear submarine crashes into the Bering Sea and mutates Godzilla. This Godzilla is mostly villainous throughout the series, but he does end up finding an egg of a Godzillasaurus on Adona Island. Godzilla wants to raise it as his own. This could be because Godzilla has nobody in his life. It's very lonely and Godzilla has the chance to finally connect with a being that's his species. Godzilla constantly fights threats to protect the younger Godzilla as it grows from a baby Godzilla to little Godzilla to Godzilla Jr. But tragedy strikes as Godzilla receives an overflux of insane amounts of radiation as Birth Island explodes, leaving Godzilla and Jr. to lose each other in the chaos. Little Godzilla is mutated into Godzilla Jr. and Godzilla is mutated into Burning Godzilla. He's in a constant state of pain and suffering. Throughout the film, he tries to find Jr. who is facing the threat of Destroya. The two eventually unite, but only for a few moments as Destroya becomes his final form. Destroya kills Junior. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah, Destroya kills Godzilla's son. I mean, you truly feel the complete misery and heartache Godzilla faces in the moment as he rage attacks Destroya. The ground literally gets too hot and Destroya has to retreat, but the JSDF shoot his wings and freeze them as he falls onto the ground and explodes immediately. Godzilla then stands there, completely heartbroken and ready to die. The JSDF fire their freeze weapons to make sure the explosion is contained and Godzilla melts down. The radiation seems to be insane. Tokyo is rendered completely uninhabitable, but all the radiation suddenly disappears. As it turns out, Godzilla Jr. had absorbed all the radiation and has grown into a brand new adult Godzilla. While the first Godzilla is definitely tragic and died in a horrible way, his legacy carried on with Jr. becoming the new Godzilla. Alright everybody, so this video is becoming a little bit on the long side and I do apologize for that. I'll be coming out with part 2 very soon, so keep an eye on the lookout. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, remember to leave a like, comment, bye bye. <laughs> oh my god.